I was inspired by the statement that was made as this conference was announced by G.K. Chesterton. The function of imagination is not so much to make wonders facts as to make facts wonders. And I am intrigued by the fact that when C.S. Lewis was nearing his uh, death, he was asked to name people who most influenced, influenced his spiritual life. He named four, two of them were specialists on mysticism and one was G.K. Chesterton. Mm -hmm. The other one was Dorothy L. Sayers, who I'm gonna talk about today because she was an expert of making facts into wonders. In fact, she was so committed to the importance of art that she wrote this text called Towards a Christian Aesthetic. This idea of art as creation is, I believe, the one important contribution that Christianity has made to aesthetics. Think of this. She's saying that Christianity has contributed to aesthetic theory. Unfortunately, we are apt to use the words creation and creativeness very vaguely and loosely, like, oh, that's a creative way to style your hair or something like that, because we do not relate them properly to our theology. And I want to discuss the relationship between artistic creativity and theology as Sayers developed it. And she has been praised by numerous theologians. This is a picture of her when she was 14 years old and she um, was dressed up as one of the characters from uh, Three Musketeers, which she performed in the original French. She took piano lessons, violin lessons. She went to theater in London. Uh, <clears throat> and when she went to Oxford University, she got involved with the Bach choir and that was her greatest passion. She just loved Bach. And this picture is of her at Oxford um, imitating the director of the Bach choir. And some of the women singing along were part of something else. She initiated a writing group called the Mutual Admiration Society. And uh, she went to theater, cinema. She won uh, awards for her photography. She was a very, very creative person. And some of you may know her as the creator of the famous amateur aristocratic sleuth, Lord Peter Whimsey. Um, her first novel came out in 1923. But what's interesting is that she made him decidedly not a Christian. She made him someone like herself, nourished by the arts. And what we see in her life is she was one of these people who come kind of compartmentalized her Christianity. So she grew up, she was the daughter of a clergyman. So she, she grew up believing in the death and resurrection of Jesus, but it didn't make that much difference to her life. In fact, if anything, she was kind of embarrassed with how legalistic and judgmental the Christians were that she ran into. So when she created Lord Peter Whimsey, she, wanted him to value the arts and not Christianity the way that um, she was. And then minor characters are Christians. So it's kind of like the minor element of Christianity in her life. Then um, three years after her first Lord Peter Whimsey novel came out and she was starting to become a bestseller. Um, <clears throat> she was a friend of Agatha Christie. She married an older divorcee, not even in a Christian wedding. I mean, that's how was, Christianity had become mar marginalized in her life. But all of a sudden, her, because Mac, her husband, was an amateur painter, she started writing about painting in her novels. And sometimes um, the novel is the solution of the murder is solved by the style or of the artist or the way he holds his palette. So these are um, novels that have painters in them. Um, one of her novels, Five Red Herrings, 
is set in Kirkubri, Scotland, which is still an artist um, colony. They would summer there, just hang out with artists. And so she just created this whole scenario set in Kirkubri uh, with focusing on how art can be revelatory of truth. But the truth in this case <laughs> is the truth of a murder where one of the artists kills another artist. She then was writing in 1936 another novel, which is primarily focused on a painter, but she abandoned it. And um, this other detective fiction writer finished it, Jill Peyton Walsh, hence this cover title. So why did she abandon it? Well, in 1936, the year she abandoned it, she was asked by people who ran the Canterbury Festival to write a play to be performed here in Canterbury Cathedral. And it was supposed to be about the history of the cathedral. And all of a sudden, Sayers realized, okay, I have been nourished and nurtured by the arts, but now I have to talk about the history of something that was built to honor Jesus Christ. And it forced her to start integrating her Christianity with her commitment to the arts. And what she did is she created, well, first she started um, with this idea that in the beginning, God created and God saw that was good. Okay, the Bible begins with creation. And I love the fact that um, seven times we're told in the first chapter of Genesis that God saw that it was good. The Bible doesn't say, and God declared it was good. God proclaimed it was good. No, the Hebrew word is the basic word for seeing. God saw that it was good. And she had this sense that, wow, creation is about seeing beauty. And then, of course, the culminating verse in the um, God's creation story is that God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. This, of course, is called the Imago Dei. I'm sure you're as artists, you're all familiar with the, the Imago Dei, the image of God, which is the Latin phrase for um, God's image. And she theorized, if the first chapter of Genesis tells us that humans are created in God's image, well, what is the God that we fulfill that image of? It's not, God isn't presented as a lawgiver, not as a redeemer, not as a judge, God is a creator. So we are most like God when we are creative. And this blew a lot of people away. So this is the conclusion she came um, through as she was writing this play uh, for Canterbury Cathedral. She called it the zeal of thy house, which is a borrow from Psalms. And it was performed in 37, 1937. And she chose as her protagonist, an architect committed to the beauty of the arts, uh, architect stonemason. But he was also, um, yeah, he was, um, uh, sexually promiscuous. He um, was not a good person, as it were. And it's based on an actual historical figure named William of Sens, a Mason architect from France. And as he designs a, a replacement tower in the 12th century, one of the towers of Canterbury Cathedral burned to the ground. And so they hired this French architect to rebuild it. And um, towards the end of the play, as he recognizes his own pride, his own sin, um, and literally Sayers um, picks up on the fact that when William of Sens was um, setting the cornerstone at the top of an arch, that 
he fell from scaffolding and broke his back, never walked again. And that was a symbol of his, his fall from his pride. He had to be brought low in order to recognize that God reigned supreme. But his response, recognizing once he confesses his sin, he says, let my work, my work, all that was good in me, all that was God, stand up and live and grow. The work is sound, no rottenness there, only in me. And in um, our small break, breakout groups, one of the things we started talking about was American cancel culture, where you're getting this sense that, um, and it comes from both the right and the left, you know, oh, um, is that person a good Christian? Um, I won't look at a painting that wasn't made by a Christian, but on the other extreme from the left, cancel culture, oh, this person is not politically correct, we're not gonna value the art. And Sayers was committed to, no, you value the art um, for its beauty because God saw that creation was good. Um, then she went one step farther she wanted to say that creation is at the very beginning of Christianity itself, which is Trinitarian. And she looks to how John begins his gospels, you know, totally echoing the beginning of Genesis, right? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, what was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him, not one thing came into being. What he came, what um, has come into being was life, and the life was the light of all people. From this idea that creation involved Jesus Christ, the Word of God, Sayers developed a Trinitarian view of creativity, and she expands it in something she calls the mind of the maker. So once again, there's the pun on the Imago Dei. The mind of God as maker and the mind of us as makers. And essentially, she reminds us that the Trinity, and I, she tended to follow the posts after the post, uh, the controversy with the filioque clause, which was added that says the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. So this is kind of her view of the Trinity. We're all familiar with the Trinity, right? But then she says, okay, that's about maker God is a trinity. We in the Imago Dei are makers and we go through a Trinitarian experience corresponding to um, God as creator is creative idea. Corresponding to Christ is energy, corresponding to the Holy Spirit is power. Now, how she illustrates this in a very simple, simple way is her own experience as a best-selling author. In other words, idea corresponds to book as you conceptualize it. Energy is as you incarnate it by writing it down. Power is as it is read and speaks to others. But the very first reader of a book is the writer, his or herself. Um, as any writer knows, you know, you write and then you read it back to yourself and you revise. The three are one in the process of creation. Now, let me illustrate with one of my friends who is a painter um, who has had her paintings um, portrayed at the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, DC. And she is a committed Christian who loves Sayers because she's my friend and learned about Sayers for me. This is a self-portrait. And um, part of what was said after we came back together from the breakout groups, someone was talking about not copying trends. And Kathy Prescott was definitely that way. She did not copy, copy trends. She was painting portraits way back. And, and you could tell she's kind of old. She was painting portraits when that wasn't the cool thing to do. 
you know, modernist art, portraiture, that, that's for lowbrow people who need representationalism. But she just felt moved to create portraits and um, she didn't care about trends. She cared about the idea, giving it energy and the power that it creates. And I love this self-portrait because she puts behind her head um, a shelf that has things from creation, rocks, uh, fossils that she has found. And it's kind of like she's um, signaling the ideas that come out of her head. But then as I go to her studio and she was fascinated with painting other artists this is um, Scott Cairns. He's the one I learned the Filioque Clause uh, controversy from because he's Eastern Orthodox, brilliant poet. And she, I'd look at her portraits and she would take her finger and point and she'd say, um, she would talk about the, uh, how she got the idea for the portrait. But then she'd say, but notice the arm here. I just felt I didn't get it right. So I had just paint over it and do it again. That is the energy as she incarnates him quite literally because it's a human figure, incarnates him on the canvas. Her idea and energy are one, just as God the Father and God the Son are one. And then she steps back from the painting and assesses its power. The three are one in the act of creation. And she has painted other um, artists, and you almost get the sense this woman is bowing before the Lord, the idea, you see her incarnated paintings behind her. And this is, if you wanna see more of her work, it's just an amazing work. This is the site you can go to, but she is especially sensitive to issues of race. And because of that, Kathy Prescott was commissioned to paint the portrait of that dear pastor in Charleston, South Carolina. Remember when a Nazi white supremacist came into a Bible study and just shot nine people at a Bible study? This, people reached out, they knew she was a Christian and that she was a great um, portrait painter. And she says she understands totally this idea of idea, energy, power operating at once. Let's move to a different kind of painting. And this has come up. Um, I enjoyed um, some the earlier conversations, especially the webinar on Sunday. Um, we all have heard of Hans Holbein's portrait of Henry VIII. And of course, he's famous for going in and destroying the beauty of monasteries. Um, as part of his Protestant Reformation. Now, the trouble is, we know part, much of it was was political and self-interested. The Pope wouldn't allow him to divorce his first wife so he could marry his pregnant mistress. I mean, and so he was just raiding all these Roman Catholic churches for the money. Uh, but the Puritans were much more pure in their motivations. And here's a, a statue of Oliver Cromwell. And they were totally anti-art. You can, um, go and visit along the English-Welsh border and see tiny churches like this where um, Puritans went in and whitewashed over all the frescoes on the walls. But now the um, whitewash is peeling off. And so you're starting to see the original painting come through. What a lot of people don't realize is that the Puritans outlawed theater, including Shakespeare. They shut down Shakespeare productions and they outlawed the celebration of Christmas because people get so caught up and it, it was prohibited. They, you couldn't sing Christmas carols. You couldn't um, put a Christmas wreath on your door because part of it is, well, look at the last syllable, mass. It's a mass to celebrate Christ, and that's Roman Catholic. But you even, um, the, the Puritans were so strong about 
purifying and Protestantism has nothing to do with Roman Catholicism, which tends to value beauty and the arts. Although, you know, part of the reason the Protestants overreacted is that we all know that people started worshiping the objects rather than the God to whom they were pointing. Uh, the Puritans, even when they came into power after the Civil War, they held parliament on Christmas Day to, you know, as a sign for other people that you do not celebrate Christmas. This is frivolous. So um, here's another creative writer. And I don't know if you Europeans are familiar with Charles Dickens' famous Christmas Carol, Scrooge. Um, has become one of the iconic characters in fiction. And part of the story is how Scrooge refuses to let his worker, Bob Cratchit, get off work early to go celebrate Christmas with his family. What most people don't realize is that Scrooge was just doing what Puritans had um, required of people. So Scrooge was the one obeying the law. Um, and so Dickens, actually there was an article written in 1903 called Charles Dickens, the man who invented Christmas. Because basically the celebration of Christmas goes back to his, his as a time of family. Unfortunately, it's kind of the beginning of the secularization. It's just Christmas is about family. It's not about Jesus. Um, so it kind of, once again, things often go through this pendulum swing um, that Dickens realized there was a problem with this Puritan denial of um, the importance of celebrating Christmas. Now, the irony, and many of you will recognize this painting, Charles Dickens was one of the many people who was disgusted by this famous pre-Raphaelite painting, Christ in the House of His Parents. He protested it. He wrote letters to the editor saying this should be taken down um, from the Royal Academy. Um, because look, Jesus is standing in sawdust. Um, he just, um, they all look just so poor and working class, which of course they were. But Dickens, like everybody else, was used to this type of portrayal of Jesus. Um, here he's in the temple, and of course, everybody's wearing satiny clothes. You have the, the classical architectural imagery. Now, that is sacred portraiture, whereas Malay was changing things. One of the ironies is that in um, Sayer's novel, where she has this old conservative guy interacting with a young modernist painter, is that he says, oh, why can't the modernist painter be more like Malay? So in just it, um, several decades, something that was a pariah, Malay's painting, now becomes the, um, the accepted traditional beautiful style. And this problem with beauty being embedded in cultural assumptions. Uh, <clears throat> so something similar happened to Dorothy Sayers. Because she was a bestseller, uh, she was asked to write a series of radio plays about the man born to be, uh, about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Um, and the whole series, 12 radio plays, were called The Man Born to be King. When BBC Radio was ready to uh, present um, the series coming up in December of um, 1941, they held a press conference. Sayers read from one of her plays and the press were shocked that she didn't use King James English. Uh, in fact, not only was she not using King James, she 
actually put slang into disciples' mouths. Um, what the famous incident is Matthew says to Philip, um, who gets shortchanged at the uh, market, he says, frankly, Philip, my boy, you've been had for a sucker. This was actually a headline in the London Times. Uh, plays about Jesus in American slang. And that really made people mad. It wasn't just slang. It was American slang that she used. And of course, she was just thinking about the fact that the disciples, most of the disciples were working class. They would speak the more working class language of their day. She spent a whole year rereading the gospels in the original Greek, um, reading Josephus histories. She wanted to make the death and resurrection of Jesus come alive. She was committed to this, but people got obsessed with the, um, the language rather than what it points to. And I talked a little bit about this on Sunday morning, that the sign becomes worshiped rather than the, um, what it is meant to capture. Uh, <clears throat> one uh, Sayers got hate mail from Christians all over England. Uh, she got threatening phone calls. She got a postcard saying, um, uh, oh, I can't remember what it says now. Um, she had one woman tell her that it was so disconcerting to have Herod um, say to someone, shut your mouths. Um, and the person wrote in her letter to Sayers saying, um, wow, it, it's just so unnerving to have someone who in such close pr pr proximity to Jesus using such crass language. And Sayers called this stained glass window view of Christianity. It's kind of, it's two-dimensional. And notice the thing with stained glass windows, you look at it rather than through it to the truth beyond. So people were obsessed with the language rather than what Sayers art was doing. Um, one person actually accused Sayers of causing the fall of Singapore to the Japanese because the third radio play was released on um, the day the Japanese attacked Singapore. And they said it was God's revenge that Sayers did not use King James English. Um, the irony of this, as many of you know, is the majority of King James English is based on, at least in the um, New Testament, is based on translations that were done by William Tyndale in uh, the 1530s. He was translating from the Latin Vulgate into English and people strangled him and burned him at the stake because everybody knows the sacred language of scripture is Latin. How dare he use English? So something that martyrs a person in one century, several centuries later, becomes the protected sacred sign of Christianity. Now, here is the wonderful bit about this. And here is my exhortation to artists. Artists, we need to change signs, whether it's in poetry or your painting or your sculpture because Sayers was willing to change her signs of truth. For her, the truth doesn't change. She changed the signs. She used um, a language that people could relate to. And um, due to the scandal set up, um, these pro uh, Protestants were demanding censorship, demanding these plays be taken off the air. They were writing letters to Winston Churchill the Archbishop of Canterbury, this was actually discussed on the floor of Parliament. This is how scandalous it became. But because of the scandal, thousands of people who would never listen to religious broadcasting tuned in. 
because they wanted to get in on the, the controversy. Ooh. And when they heard about the controversy, they assumed this woman was going to be, you know, Sayers was demythologizing and showing there weren't miracles. But what they got was a gospel message, which they understood for the first time in their slang slainy lives. Sayers got thousands of letters telling her that she finally, un that they finally understood what um, Jesus's mission was, that they have finally decided to go to church, that they have finally started reading the Bible. It transformed thousands because she was willing to change the signs without changing the truth. Um, she described the, the problem that especially Protestants were having with the plays, she aligns this reaction to change with docetism, which is one of the early heresies of the church. It comes from a Greek word that means to seem. And the docetic heresy basically says, well, God would never deign to take on flesh. Um, after all, and Marcion, um, one of the early church fathers actually said, after all, flesh is filled with excrement. God would never take on flesh. And so they said, well, yeah, people saw Jesus, but he only seemed to be human. It was just God walking and appearing, giving this illusion. And the underlying part, um, the descetic and totally heretical Christology, which denies the full humanity of our Lord. So docetism from people who receive art, but there are other heresies from people who create art. Um, and she uh, picked up on ancient heresies, the Arian heresy, of course, um, and this was referred to at the wonderful presentation on the importance of the Trinity a couple of days ago, that Jesus was not co-eternal and one substance with God, that Jesus was actually created by God. So Sayers says Aryan art has, um, is just Jesus on his own, Jesus without God, hence energy without idea, which means all technique, no vision. And I went online to look up what were considered the hundred worst movies of all time. <laughs> And this was one of them, all technique, no vision. The opposite extreme, and this has come up throughout this conference, the sessions I've been in, she calls the Manichaean heresy. And this goes back to a Persian, and this was this is the heresy that tempt Augustine, those of you who have read the um, confessions, it held that matter is evil, spirit is good. It's the opposite of the of Aryan art. Manichaean art for Sayers is evangelism, um, is propagandistic. It's when evangelism outweighs any attention to artistry. So it's all idea without energy, without the incarnation. Um, and she applies it to film. Uh, she uh, put out by a religious society. She said, bad photography, bad acting, bad dialogue produced a result so grotesquely irreverent that the pictures um, could, whoops, could not have been shown in churches without bringing Christianity into contempt. And she felt that the people who make art and just to evangelize others are um, essentially denying the Imago Dei. <clears throat> I want to end with the um, fascinating element that uh, we get from the New Testament that Jesus heals the blind in different ways. Isn't that fascinating? It would have been so much more efficient if Jesus just went around and um, saw all these blind and crippled people and just goes, okay, you guys, you're all healed. I have a, a sermon on the Mount to give. No, Jesus interacts with every single, according to the gospels, 
different blind people and he heals them in different ways. One person, he puts mud on the eyes and then asks him to wash in the river of Siloam. Another, he just touches the eyes. Another, he just says, um, your faith has, has made you whole. And it strikes me that this is the role of the artist, that especially the Christian artist, that part of what we are trying to do is heal the blind, um, but that doesn't mean one style means all. It doesn't mean our art has to have signs of the cross and Christian, it has to be about Christianity. That Jesus brings us to the light in different ways. And God has given us different gifts so that we fulfill the Imago day. For in him was light and this was the light of the world. I talk much more about how Sayers applies this, uh, <clears throat> her theology of creativity, her Trinitarian aesthetic in this book, Subversive. And you can see how, man, she caused the biggest religious controversy in 20th century England. She's pretty subversive, but it's through art. Um, and she inspired me to write this book, Changing Signs of Truth. Um, to communicate, okay, the truth doesn't change, but the signs of truth change. But then I had to theorize, how do we know when change in, changing signs help the cause of Christ and are not helpful to the cause of Christ?